Hello and welcome to The Spirit Spa, an online sanctuary dedicated to supporting you if you're in the early stages of recovery from a nervous breakdown. My aim is to help you un understand why the breakdown happens to you and to identify your next natural steps towards recovery. I'm Karen Packwood and today's message from the wilderness is a story that I've written to support people like you in the early stages of recovery. The reason I've written this story is because I want to um, help you identify with some of the core um, feelings that you have in the early stages. I also want to share this um, story because um, in my previous video when I've talked about journaling, I've talked about how creativity is very, is, you know, is very helpful as a healing tool. And although what I'm about to um, share with you is, is a story that I've compiled and I've taken it through to sort of completion. My writing um, for healing didn't actually begin like that. It began right in the early stages as journaling, just as a way of kind of helping me to kind of connect with my, with my feelings and what was going on for me. And the reason that I used journaling was because I had so much shame about what was going on for me. I didn't feel able to share my feelings with um, other people. And as you know, I've recorded this particular video specifically for men and uh, because I've written a, ma a male version of the story for you. It's kind of nice to have an opportunity to talk directly to you as a group of men um, because when um, I work with male clients or male viewers um, email me, there, there tend to be three things that they share with me that I don't often hear from women. And these are the three things that they often talk about in terms of some of the difficulties that have either triggered their breakdown or, or, or are helping the recovery journey be a little bit difficult. And the first is, um, often there's some issue around work and, not, and, and actually not being involved in work that feels nourishing or integrity with your true self. But the reason that men often stay in these jobs is because they feel they have the responsibility to care for their families. And then the third thing that men will often share with me that because they're men, they actually find it very difficult to talk about their feelings with people and know who they can talk about them with, even with immediate family members. And my next video is going to be a talk about um, talking to family members about your feelings. But these are the three things that men often share with me. And even though I'm a woman, it, they're actually things that I can really identify with. Um, and that's because when I was in the early stages of my breakdown, I was um, completely responsible for the care of my family. My daughter's father had left me while I was pregnant. Um, he chose to completely abandon us and also chose to um, offer no financial contribution to, to the family, which meant that I was absolutely in the, in the position of having to be not only a mother, but also the breadwinner, the person taking responsibility for every aspect of our family life. So I do have an insight into what that feels like, even though I'm not a man. And of course, to do that, I had to actually go, to, go and do a job which actually wasn't supporting me and actually was adding to my stress and it was kind of the final thing that, that triggered my, my final sort of breakdown, if you like. Um, and then ironically, even though I'm creating these YouTube videos to share with the world, um, I actually am quite a private person in terms of sharing my feelings. So um, I do also kind of have some understanding about that difficulty of actually um, you know, talking about your feelings and letting people know what, what's going on with you. And actually the truth is when you're in those early stages of breakdown, it's such a complex um, kind of cocktail of emotions that are going on. It's very hard to talk about them anyway, isn't it? So I'm going to share this story with you. It's called The Truth Whisperer. Please listen to it. And then for your um, sort of your wilderness writing activity uh, for this week, I'm gonna suggest that in your journal, you make some notes on how the story resonates with you. What does it trigger in you? What does it make you um, think of? How does it make you feel? What does it kind of stir up inside you? Does it inspire you in any way? Does it offer kind of any guidance and support? Uh, does it trigger any ideas for how you can take your next step towards recovery? So the Truth Whisperer, um, I do have it written down, so you will see me referring to, um, to, my, to my story that's written down. Um, 
but please I want you to imagine that as you listen you're sitting in this wood with me surrounded by these amazing trees I'm recording this kind of first thing in the morning so the forest is very very still um, I want you to imagine that you're kind of cozied up in this 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 den and that we have a very beautiful fire before us and that's keeping us warm and bringing kind of life back to us so the truth whisperer once upon a time a broken man lay stricken with a terrifying illness life it seemed had fallen out of him his frail body was present yet his spirit was not distraught his loved ones attempted every imaginable cure. Tinctures, broths, and poultices filled with the finest herbs. The world's widest, wisest medicine people were gathered, yet even they were unable to determine what had caused his malady or how best to cure him. If the finest physicians in the world could offer no remedy, who could? Ask. The man's young son rarely left his side. Each morning, he would open the window drapes, then gently wash his father's face and brush his hair. Each evening, he would tuck the bed covers under his father's chin, settling him for the night. In between times, they would sit in silence. One dead to sleep, the other left to ponder on this strange sight of his inert father. Try as he might, Ast could think of nothing that might help him. One day, glancing idly through the chamber window to the pine forest that grew beyond the garden lawn, Ast spied a shadowy movement amongst the trees. He knew instinctively by its size and shape that this was no normal forest creature. It was too small and too slim. Was the misty rain falling today playing tricks with his vision? Ast concentrated on the dense copse of trees, determined not to miss another movement, for he had a good idea who belonged to this shadow. Selk, the wise man of the woods. Everyone in the region knew of him, yet few had seen him. To the young folk, like Ast, Selk was a mystery. His grandparents and other village elders recalled times long ago when Selk would come to the market to sell foraged mushrooms and berries. These days, preferring to keep him to himself in his home deep within the forest, he was rarely seen. Often, the only sign of his existence were the wispy plumes of smoke that would rise above the trees. Today was the first time Ast had come close to catching sight of him. He watched, hopefully, for several more minutes, Yet as quickly as Selk had almost appeared, he vanished. Becoming lost in his thoughts, Ast returned his attention to his father. Straightening the bed sheets, arranging fresh flowers for the bedside table, and encouraging in vain his father to sip some warming broth. How, he wondered, examining his father's frail face, did Selk keep well living in the forest, no matter how inclement the weather? To living in a forest in, independent of all others, he reckoned, you must know how to care for yourself when illness comes upon you. Wearily placing down his father's uneaten broth, Ast made a decision. He would seek Selk's counsel. That night, trusting the moonlight to guide him, he headed into the forest. With no desire to alarm this solitary man, Ast trod gently, picking his way through brambles and low-hanging branches until he saw, just ahead, firelight glinting through the trees. Crouching over his fire, Selk poured steaming broth into a roughly carved vessel. Rising from his haunches, he proffered the drink to Ast. Come, he commanded, with a gentleness surprising to his young guest. Selku continued, beckoning to a moss-covered tree stump close to the fire. Taking the broth, Ast perched on the stump as this man with wizened hands and bark-like skin stoked the fire. Bring your father to the fire.
Selk spoke with authority, his voice clear and calm, leaving Ast in no doubt that he was in the presence of a deeply wise man. You know why I'm here? he asked. Selk nodded. I've been watching for many months. Even the finest medicine people have been unable to find a cure for my father. Sensing Selk's compassion, Ast felt safe to share his sorrow. What ails your father isn't curable by medicines or potions. Ast waited, unsure what to say. What did Selk mean? The ailment runs more deeply than that, continued Selk, diverting his focus from the fire to look for the first time fully into Ast's eyes, where the firelight magnified his fear. Selk reached for Ast's hands, placing it tenderly between his palms. Your father is not just sick in his body. He has lost his connection to his true nature. How did this happen, whispered Ast. It's easily done, replied Selk. Many people these days live far away, far removed from their purest natures. Most have forgotten the old ways, when we rose with the sunrise and slept with the sunset, living in harmony with the turning of the seasons. As we loosen our tether to these natural rhythms of life, we become sapped, left brittle and exhausted until, like your father, we shatter and lose ourselves. I don't understand, said Ast. Father has wanted for nothing. He's lived a life with many privileges, denied to many. How has this made him sick? When did you last see your father in the woods picking wild bluebells? asked Selk. Ast turned to the fire, surprised by the question. He couldn't recall ever having seen his father in the woods. When your father was a small child, he would spend hours here. Sometimes he would forage, other times he would run and play amongst the trees. But what he loved most was to read peacefully under the shade of the leaves. Ast, who'd only ever seen his father rushing from one work meeting to another, couldn't imagine him sitting still long enough to read anything. But one day, your father forgot to come, no doubt believing something else was more important, probably one of those privileges you speak of. Stooping to prevent a branch rolling from the fire, Selk continued. The problem is that he continued to forget until the day turned into a year and the year turned into many years, by which time he had forgotten about these trees, which he once loved dearly forgot they even existed. Worse still, he had forgotten how he had, he, how he, he had forgotten how he would once thrived amongst them. Selk stooped to retrieve a recently fallen fir cone from the forest floor. Holding it aloft, he watched as moonlight bounced from each seed wing. These privileges that you talk of might be considered false privileges, enslaving people to ways of being that don't nourish them causing them to wither like flowers deprived of water on a hot summer's day, to forget all of who they were, of the things that truly nourished them. Selk gifted the fir cone to Ast, placing it in his hands as if it were a piece of precious gold. Heart, uh, Ast's heart pounded, his breath frozen. Is there no hope for my father? He hardly dare ask the question, but knew he must. It was, after all, his sole reason for visiting Selk. Your father has been brought to a crossroads in his life, where he must choose whether to live the life of his most natural self, honouring all of who he was born to be, or to live a life where his deepest desires and gifts remain ignored. Ast cast his thoughts back to the vision of his father lying in the, on his bed as he left him earlier this evening, realising that his father was far away from the boy Selk had described, reading, reading peacefully under the trees. No medicine will heal your father, nor any physician. There is only one person who can heal him. Ast couldn't imagine who this might be. If no doctor could cure his father, who could? Your father must become his own healer. He must learn to gently listen to the deepest beats of his heart, to the rustle of his dreams as they sweep through his soul. 
Most importantly, he must release all that no longer serves him so that he can welcome in a life of truth beyond anything he has ever known. It takes strength and courage to do this, but your father has both of these qualities in abundance. But he's so weak right now. There is great strength in weakness. It is when we are at our weakness that our strength is truly tested. It is when we are tested that we discover how capable we truly are. And when we know this, we become truly free. As wondered how Selk knew this, yet sensed it, was, there was, it wasn't the time to question him. He kept his focus on his father. How can my father do this? He's already begun. The moment he shattered, his healing began. I don't understand. He's been ill for many months with no sign of improvement. How old do you think these trees are? asked Selk. Fifty years old? Guest asked. In truth, he had no idea. He had never been taught about the ways of the forest, even though he'd grown up with the sweet pinewood aromas drifting through the window on the gentle summer breeze. Selk shook his head. The youngest is about 200, whilst the eldest is closer to 500, if not more. Sometimes, if something is truly to grow into its fullest expression of itself, much time is needed. Even that tiny fir cone has taken three years to mature. Ast glanced down in wonder, seeing the fir cone with its many seeds in a whole new light. When a person has spent years rushing blindly through their life, often hiding from truths or burying precious parts of themselves, or when life has become brutal with too many burdens to bear, we crash into ourselves, causing immense injury. These injuries have often been built up innocently over a lifetime. Deep rest becomes vital. There should be no rush. This particular healing journey is not a quick dash and must never be forced into becoming one. Accepting this is the first and most important step. This is when the first test of courage is taken, the test of honour in the exhaustion, terror and fear, accepting the overwhelm and confusion. It's not only by allowing oneself to sink into these states of un unvulnerability in their entirety that healing can come forward. In the grand scheme of things, a few months are nothing. This is deep healing that is taking place. It requires and deserves immense, pa immense patience and deep trust. So my father is doing what he needs to do? Ast was beginning to understand. Yes, replied Selk with a reassuring smile. He is doing exactly what he needs to do. I feel so helpless. Is there nothing I can do to help him? As I said, reminded Selk, bring him here with the fire and these trees. I will teach him how to reconnect with his natural ways. But he can't walk. It will be impossible. Ast seeking support in his anguish gripped the fir cone. He doesn't have to come here physically. Tell him of your visit here with me, of the forest and the fire. Ask him to imagine that he is under this tree where long ago he once played freely. He will remember. Then tell him, when he is ready to meet with me, to whisper the words, I am ready. I will hear and I will come. Then, together, we will begin. Still clutching the fir cone, Ast left the forest, full of doubts, yet knew that he had no choice but to trust Selk. Visiting him, had been, him, visiting him had been his last hope. If this failed, surely his father would die. The next night, enveloped in the gentle warmth of the fire burning in the hearth at the foot of the bed, Ast tenderly stroked his father's brow and recounted his encounter with Selk. He knows that you're too weak to return to the forest, Father. He asks you to cast your mind back to your favourite tree where you once sat peacefully reading. His father showed no sign of understanding. Ast continued, desperate to reignite his father's buried memories. Recalling the fir cone, he yanked it from his pocket. Can you recall the forest trees you loved so deeply and the sound of the breeze through the trees? 
he raised the fur cone to his father's face, hovering it near his nose, hoping the fragrance might dis dislodge the slightest memory. Remember the earth, father, its dank smell under each step, and the soft moss that cushioned the bark you sat upon. Take time to remember, father. It's all still within you, waiting for you to return. Still, his father lay heavy on the bed. Asked, made one last desperate plea. He says you are strong, father, that only the strongest allow themselves to feel this weakness. Did you hear that? You aren't weak. You're strong. Selk is waiting for you. All you need to say silently within yourself is, I am ready, and he will come. Ast sat in uneasy stillness, unclear if his words had crossed the divide between life and death surrounding his father. There was nothing else he could do. His visit to Selk had been his last hope. As dusk turned to night, the rhythmic crackling of the fire lulled him into exhausted sleep. Cold darkness filled the room as the fire died out. Father and son slept, neither knowing what the morning would bring. Ast was woken the next morning by a gentle song coming from the direction of his father's bed. Selk, perched on the soft eider down, was braiding sprigs of lavender and spruce leaves onto his still sleeping father's pillow. The room was filled with sweet fragrance. A blazing fire crackled on the hearth. Selk indicated for him to join him on his father's bed. You came, whispered Ast, knowing this could mean only one thing. Yes, nodded Selk. So he choked by tears, Ast was unable to speak. Yes, Silk understood. It took several hours, but eventually your father was able to see his old favourite tree and recall his many happy days sitting in his peace there. He was able to remember the forest and the trees, the fires and the rivers. He was able to remember nights spent watching the moonlight from this very room. And he was able to remember the time when he was still connected to the most sacred part of himself. It was then that I knew he was ready. Reaching into his pouch hanging from his waist, Selk retrieved a small vial. Carefully uncorking the bottle, he dabbed a potion that smelt of the forest, fresh after a heavy rainfall, onto the father's wrists. What happens now? Although Ast was delighted by Selk's words, he couldn't help noticing that his father remained in his deep slumber with two anxious furrows entrenched on his brows. There was no sign of him returning to life. Now we are ready to begin, replied Selk. But remember, my child, the need for patience. It is from the cave of patience that most mag the most magnificent new lives can be born. It is in this cave of healing that we can hear the whisper of our deepest truths, calling us back to ourselves, that so we that we can discover the steps that will lead us back to where we were born to be, naturally. With that, he returned the vial to his pouch, wrapped his cloak around him and gathered the frail father into his arms. Come, child, he instructed. It is time for us to return to the forest where the fire is waiting for us. Asked dutifully followed Selk from this room that reeked of death back to the forest through many dense thickets until they returned to the glade where, sure enough, the fire was burning bright. He watched as Selk gently laid his father on deerskin by some warm embers. What, he wondered, was about to happen. As if reading his mind, Selk, who was gently stoking the fire, spoke. Now it is time for your father take, to take the next step towards healing, to become more authentically, authentically connected to himself as a man than he ever thought possible. As Selk asked watched as Selk returned to stoking the fire, observing the flames carefully as they increased in size and heat blasted from its heart. Now it is time to begin. Speaking calmly, he placed down his stoking stick, once more raised the frail father into his arms and disappeared wordlessly into the flyer, into the fire as flames enveloped them both. Ast knew that all he could do now was to wait and trust.
Instinctively knowing that his job was to keep the flames burning, he settled himself once more on the moss-covered trunk, waiting for his father's return. This story represents the three parts of ourselves. The father re represents the part of you that's suffering the breakdown. The son represents the part of you that wishes for the healing pathway. Selk represents your inner healer, the part of you that knows how to heal. The fire represents your natural life force, the human spirit that fights to overcome adversity. The trees represent nourishment, care, support, protection and boundaries. The father in the story became ready to take his next steps towards healing. And so have you. In your journal, take some time to journal on how that story has impacted on you, what it's made you feel, what it's made you think, what it's inspired in you. And if you'd like to reach out to me to share any of your feelings, thoughts, or ask any questions, please do so in the comments box below or email me at karenpackwood at gmail.com. And if you'd like to find out more about my work, please publish, uh, please um, visit my newly published website at www.karenpackwood.com. I'm wishing you a truly peaceful, loving, calm, kind and healing day.